Welcome to Changing Higher Ed, a podcast dedicated to helping higher education leaders improve their institutions. My name is Dr. Drum McNaughton, and I'm the CEO of The Change Leader, a management consultancy that helps university leaders create sustainable higher ed institutions through holistic approaches to strategic management, university academics and operations, change management, leadership, and governance. Our podcast brings you the latest in higher ed news, as well as some of the top experts in our profession who will share with you their perspectives on how you can grow your institution. Deborah Maui is a marketing and branding expert for higher ed. She has led highly successful marketing initiatives in highly complex organizations in consumer packaged goods, higher education, and agency settings. Deb got her start at Helene Curtis, which is now part of Unilever leading and developing innovative products for large and successful brands such as Axe, Dove, Degree, and Suave. She transitioned to the higher ed sector 12 years ago and since then has developed and implemented unique and compelling brand stories for large publics, privates, healthcare universities, law schools, and independent K-12 school districts. Most recently at Columbia College Chicago, Deb developed and implemented the college's first brand strategy, creating a brand architecture along with visual and messaging strategies that highlighted Columbia's unique position as an arts and media college for students who see the world through a creative lens. This resulted in their growing enrollments and retaining more students. Deb is a sought-after speaker and regular contributor to Inside Higher Ed's Call for Action blog, and I'm proud to call her a valued member of the Change Leader team. Deb, welcome to the show. Thank you, Drum. It's great to be here. Likewise. And hey, you know, you've been doing this now for 25 years, including 12 years with higher ed. I'm sure you've seen a ton of changes over those past 12 years. What are the biggest changes you've seen? Yeah, there's been a tremendous amount of change uh, since I started at at DePaul. It's actually 13 years ago now, um, but who's counting? I would say there are really three major changes that I've seen. The first is just the changing demographics mean that there are fewer traditional age students than there were when I started. When I started, almost every higher ed institution in the country was seeing increasing enrollments year on year. And we were all patting ourselves on the back of what a great job we were doing at marketing and recruiting. But really, we were just riding a a demographic wave. And so those days are over, really. We're seeing declining numbers of students graduating from high school. That's the first thing. I think the second thing is the crash of 2008 meant that a lot of parents saw their college savings for their kids disappear really overnight because they were planning to use their home equity to borrow against to fund college. And that really went away pretty much overnight. And so a lot of families are having increasing difficulty to pay. So it's a double whammy, really, with fewer traditional age students and then fewer among them who can pay full price or who can pay a significant percentage of the price. And then thirdly, we're seeing increasing dissatisfaction and really distrust with higher ed institutions or higher ed as an industry, really. I think it's really more about the industry than than any one institution. But Parents and students are increasingly questioning the value of a college degree. And in the past, really, it was just a given that a college degree was going to pay off and it was a good thing to do. And so we're seeing a lot of people really question that. So I think those are the big changes that I've seen over the past 13 years. And, you know, it's interesting you bring those up, especially that second one about the the changing demographics. Yes, there's definitely fewer high school students, what's considered to be the traditional students, 18 to 24, going to college. But we're seeing a huge increase. In fact, right now, I think I recently read that 73 or 74 percent of all college students are what's called non-traditional, which are 24 to 70 years old. And the reason they're going back to school is really three things. One, they need a degree to be able to compete. Second, they want a degree to get up higher in the ladder of wherever they're working. Or third, they want more money at their their job. And so these changes that have happened, most higher ed folks are seeing them, but I don't know that I've had 
anyone enunciate them as clearly as you have. Well, I want to say one thing about the challenge of attracting adult students. It's more challenging from a marketing standpoint to attract adult completion students. Because if you think about it, 17-year-olds are easy to target. You know where they are. They're in high school. And they're signing up for the PSAT and the SAT. And so you can buy their names and send them communication materials directly. Adult completion students can be anywhere. So it's really a marketing challenge to figure out how to reach them. But at the same time, fortunately, the cost of advertising is coming down because of digital advertising and the ability to to target much more narrowly. So from a marketing standpoint, it's really changed the game when you're talking about shifting from that traditional age student to needing to identify and reach out to adult students. And it's also given rise to a whole industry having to do with students wanting to go to college and websites publicizing the colleges and then selling the names of people to those colleges who are actually yeah. looking. So it's yeah. changing the way that advertising is being done. It's changing the way gathering leads is being done. I mean, huge changes. Yes. So that we're all talking uh, apples and apples instead of apples and oranges. <laughs> what is positioning and branding and why is it important to higher ed? Well, I think it's one of those things, if you asked 100 different people, for their definition of positioning and branding, you'd get a hundred different answers. So I'll tell you what my definition is. My definition of positioning or position is the space that your institution or your brand, whatever your brand is, takes up in the minds of the external audience. So whoever that is. So it's what you represent to people who are thinking about going to college or their parents or any of the other audiences that we deal with. Branding is the strategy behind trying to change that positioning in people's minds. And so it's the act of creating a, you know, an intentional strategy to say, this is what we want to stand for in people's minds. These are the the words or the phrases that we want people to use when they talk about us and when they think about us. And that makes perfect sense. I know when we do planning with organizations and we get into the branding and the positioning portion of it, we say that positioning is the answer to the question, what is the one thing that's unique, different, and better about us in the eyes of our customer versus the competition in the higher ed marketplace that has them either hiring our graduates or wanting to attend our institution? I really love that. And I'll tell you why one of the reasons I really love it is because of the emphasis on one thing. Marketers would love to have people remember 10 or 15 things about our brands because we know all the great things about the brands, but you're really lucky if you get people to remember one thing. So you have to be very deliberate and really tough on yourself and the people who are working on the brand strategy to say, you guys, we got one thing and we need to figure out what that one thing is. So I really, really like that, your definition. Well, it reminds me of Nike. Just do it. I mean, that's Mm -hmm. been their logo, their tagline for as long as I can remember. That's the one thing that you you remember about Nike is just get out there and do it. That's exactly right. That's a great example. So when you're talking to university presidents, what are the things that they really need to think about when positioning their institution and then branding it? So the first thing that they need to understand is that they already have a brand. Because any institution that's been around for a while has a positioning in the minds of people. It stands for something already. So you're not starting from nothing. And that's actually more difficult than starting from nothing. Because when you're talking about changing the way that people perceive your brand, you have to first undo what they think of it now and then create a new positioning in their minds. So that's one thing. The second thing that they really need to understand is that the brand has to be central to the strategic planning process that virtually every institution goes through in every five, six, eight, ten years. So many institutions view those things as completely separate. So the the brand strategy is over here. Marketing leads the brand strategy. That's all well and good. And then we've got our strategic planning process over here. But if you think about the brand as being the promise that you're making to the world, really your strategic plan has to be about 
what are those things that we need to do to improve the way that people view our brand? It has to be about what are we doing and what are we not doing to deliver on our brand promise that we're making to people. And I believe that the brand is foundational to the strategic planning process. And you really don't see that a lot of places. No, you you don't. And I might differ with you a little bit as I would say that the two have to go hand in hand, but does the, the positioning and the branding come first or does the planning come first as a result? I think it's one of those things, you know, what came first, the chicken or the egg? Yeah. And, and I think it can work that way as well. You can do them at the same time. I just hate to see it when institutions view them as completely separate and don't view any interconnectedness between the brand and the strategic planning process. I think that's a mistake. Oh, I I fully agree. And I think if every institution going forward, they need to have an execution plan for their strategic plan. And part of that is how are you going to be marketing your institution? So it should be part and parcel of your planning process. Right. Absolutely. So you talked about already having a brand and how difficult that can be to change, how do you go about finding what your brand perception is? That's about market research. And the important thing to understand about brand perception is that you have to understand the brand perception among people external to your institution. So it doesn't matter what your faculty think. It doesn't matter what your president thinks the brand is. What matters is what does the brand stand for among people who are external to your institution? So what does it stand for to prospective students and their parents? So it's really about about market research. And market research can be really extensive. It can be really comprehensive, or it can be really simple. And I I think a lot of people get scared about market research because they think, oh, that sounds really expensive and it's going to take a long time. And it can be expensive and it can take a long time, but it doesn't have to be. So I've seen institutions successfully do online focus groups uh, with parents and students and guidance, prospective students and guidance counselors and even their alumni very cost efficiently. I've also seen institutions do very complicated uh, surveys and either can work. It depends on how much do you understand about your institution's brand right now? How much are you, are you trying to change it? And what do you need to learn? So it can be very flexible. Well, it seems like a simple way of, of doing this is when you have students apply, you would ask them three basic questions. How did you hear about us? What did you hear about us? And what attracted you to us? Yeah, I'm going to differ with you a bit there because people have a really hard time answering those questions. So if I said to you, Drew, how did you first hear about Starbucks? You'd probably give me an answer, but I don't have any reliability that that's how you actually heard about it. So it gets back to what I said earlier that these brands have been around for a long time. So if you ask people how they first heard about it or what they heard about it, they really, they'll give you an answer, but they really can't give you an answer with any reliability. So what I like to do is really have one-on-one conversations with people where I can dig more deeply into their answers. So if I say, I'll use my own institution as an example, what do you think about Aurora University? What does it stand for in your mind? Well, I think it's a good institution. Well, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by good? How do you know it's good? Um, Because it's really those probing questions that allow you to get below the surface and really get a solid understanding of what people believe and why they believe it. That makes perfect sense. I tend to reduce things to very simple answers, and obviously, this is not a simple one. Well, I mean, I like simple answers too, but I also, as a marketing person, I study people, and I, and I know how they behave, and I know how they respond to things, and I know that particularly Americans, if you ask them a question, they'll give you an answer, but it's not necessarily a reliable one. <laughs> oh, I, I get it. Uh, <laughs> so, one of the challenges is, is we've seen that enrollment is declining. Is that a warning sign that a brand could be tired? Absolutely. I think it's a warning sign of potentially a couple of things. First of all, it's a warning sign that your value proposition is off. So people don't know why they should spend the money that you're charging to come to your institution. They don't know what they're going to get from it in terms of the education they'll receive and then also the career outcomes they'll get. 
clients, enrollment declines can come from a number of things, but I think if your enrollment's declining, it's really important that you ask that question. What do people think about our brand? And, and is this about needing to sharpen our brand? Mm -hmm. And when we take a look at what we call alignment, it's looking, are your strategies, are your structures and your processes all working together smoothly? And your strategies, mm -hmm. really, branding is one of your strategies and mm -hmm. your structures do you have the right kind of people in enrollment? Do you have the right mm -hmm. kind of people in marketing to be able to take care of the students that would be coming in? Are they well-trained, et cetera, et cetera? So all of those things have to be in alignment. Yeah, I would never say that branding is the only thing that would cause an enrollment decline. To your point, there are lots of things that can cause an enrollment decline, but it's certainly something to consider. What are we doing around brand strategy? When is the last time we did market research? When's the last time we sharpened our brand language? And what is our value proposition? Brand language is one of those critical things, especially when we take a look at it from a generational perspective, is if you're competing, and, and you referred to this a little bit earlier, with adult students, you've got to figure out where they are. You've got to figure out what makes them tick and how do you language it in that way which makes mm -hmm. the marketing equation that much more complex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And another challenging thing about non-traditional students, so, or so, so students who are a bit older, is that they have busy lives. They have jobs and they have families, and they're looking not only at what's the value of your edu the education that you're offering in terms of what it's going to do for them, but what's the convenience factor? You know, where are you located? Is it somewhere that I can get to easily in the evenings? And even more importantly, do you have online classes that I can take so that I don't have the travel time? Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's all of those things, which makes your job as someone who does marketing, positioning, and branding far more difficult than it used to be. Absolutely. As I said, it used to be kind of shooting fish in a barrel, and uh, it's not that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> May not be the best analogy, but... Uh, no, maybe not. <laughs> just kind of wrapping up here. If you were going to tell a university president three things that they needed to be aware about with their branding, their positioning, their marketing, what would those three things be? Well, the first thing is that they need to do market research on a regular basis because they need to understand what the external market thinks of them. And that is probably the, among the most valuable information they can get. The second thing I talked about, the integration of the branding and the strategic planning process. I think the third thing is to look around at the materials that are being produced by the institution and look at for how consistent or inconsistent they are in terms of the look, in terms of the language, in terms of the feel, in terms of the tone. Are we sending a consistent message? Because it's really, really important that you're speaking with one voice when you're talking to really all of the audiences that we speak to. And if you think about a brand that does that really, really well, look at Starbucks. I used Starbucks as an example before when I was teasing you, but it's a brand that is incredibly consistent from the attire of the baristas to what the stores look like, to their email communications that we all get. They just do everything really consistently. Target's another example of a brand. They're, they've lost their way a little bit, but it used to be that if you saw a Target ad on television, you could tell within the first three seconds, even if they didn't tell you it was a Target ad, you knew what it was because they paid attention to all of those details. And that's something that is difficult in a higher ed institution because you tend to have a lot of different groups producing things. It's hard to be completely centralized, but look at what's being produced and look at whether the logos are consistent, the messaging is consistent, the colors, the tone, all of that. The ones that I really like have done a fabulous job are schools like Carnegie Mellon. You know, 25 mm -hmm. years ago, it was a, a small university in Pittsburgh. And right now they are the leader in artificial intelligence, in robotics, in cyber. They're really taking the lead in real cutting edge IT areas. And yeah, it gets back to what you said about the one thing. They know what their one thing is. They're not trying to promote all things to all people. Exactly. It kind of comes down to it. And what I learned back, you know, when I was going to graduate school, 
is what marketing is, is you're competing for mind share with this. So many different messages out there. It's like you said, what is the one thing that you want to be known for in the marketplace? And how do you expand on that? Mm -hmm. Yep, absolutely. Totally agree. Well, any last uh, words of wisdom for our guests? Oh, branding doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be laborious. It doesn't have to be difficult. It can be very simple and straightforward. There are a lot of really good models out there for how to do branding. Just start and you'll be amazed at how much you, you learn. If you start with good market research, you'll be amazed at how much you learn and where it can take you. Great. Thanks for listening this week. And a special thank you to this week's special guest, Deb Maui. Thanks, Deb. Always a pleasure having you on the show. Our next guest is Jerry Zernecki, Chairman and CEO of the National Leadership Institute and Principal Stockholder of the Deltinium Group. Jerry currently serves as Chair of the Board of Trustees of the National University System, and we'll be talking about mergers and acquisitions as growth strategies for higher education institutions. If you like this podcast, please take a minute to subscribe to the show. And if you're listening on the Apple Podcast app, would you please take a moment to give us a rating and review? You can find out more information and show notes at changinghighered.com. And if you have guests and or other topics you'd like to hear about, please email us at podcast at changinghighered.com to let us know. Remember, creating sustainable higher ed institutions requires three things. Taking a holistic view of your institution, aligning strategies, structures, and processes, and ensuring stakeholders are attuned to where you're going. Without any of those three things, you won't get your institution where you want it to go. Until next time.